In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. This is the second to the last in a five-part series I've been focusing on prayer, entitled Seven Minutes to Live. As you remember, we started by saying if any of us knew that we had seven minutes and only seven minutes to live, I'm sure we would all spend part, if not all, of that time praying. And yet, with the hundreds of minutes God gives us every day, sometimes we have, fought, have trouble finding seven minutes to devote to Him. I titled it that way because, of course, when we're desperate, we turn to God. But I also titled it Seven Minutes to Live because, if you remember, I, re I, re I reflected on the fact, and maybe you have had this in your own life, you say, how are you doing to people? And they say, well, I'm okay, getting by, surviving, hanging on. Those might be surviving, but they're not living. So we want to focus on how we can get to really living the abundant life that God intended us to have. Today we're going to focus on how and why we ask God for things. I want to focus on that specifically today because for many of us, praying is that. Praying is our time to ask God for the things that we need. Now, I want to say to you first and very clearly, that's not wrong. In fact, in the English word pray, that's inherent in the word. We used to say a long, long time ago, I pray thee, and then we'd ask for something. It was a way to set up a request. So praying for things that we want is not wrong. What is wrong is that for too much of our time in prayer, that's all we do. We bring our list to God, and it's good that we're doing it, and it's good that we're bringing the desires of our heart to him, but he has so much more waiting for us than just receiving our laundry list of requests. If we're going to see it differently, if we're going to see that when we pray, we find our way back not just to surviving but living, we're going to have to see prayer differently. It doesn't mean we're going to stop asking for things. It just means we're going to ask it in a much different context than perhaps we have been doing so far. So let's talk about what true prayer really is. And again, if I could have picked a verse to start out today's epistle on this topic, this is the one I would have picked. Let me read it to you again. It was read to us beautifully this morning. Thanks, by the way, to our teens reading the epistle so beautifully this month. Uh, St. Paul says to the Corinthians, Brethren, working together with him, meaning Jesus, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. Now, to most of us, that's just a, a nice way to set up something important he's going to say, but there's so much in this one sentence, I want to look at it really, really carefully. Brethren, working together with him, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. This sentence assumes, predicated on the idea that long we, before we go to utter a request to God, we have been working together with him. And I'll say it in a way that perhaps makes more sense to us. He has been working together with us. Now, I know when we bring our prayers to God, and as I said, it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to hope that God will answer our prayers, meaning he'll do what we want. And again, the unspoken, even unthought assumption is God needs a little bit of education. We'd never say that. I just said it out loud and you're all cringing. How could God need an education? And yet don't all of us, and I include myself in this, assume that God needs to hear what it is we want. God, I'm really having a tough time. Good to ask. Not good to imagine that God didn't already know that and, according to St. Paul, has already been working with us. Not in general, not on other topics, on that topic, in that issue. God has long before we even thought, by the way, to utter a prayer, he was already working with us on that issue, long before we knew that. 
There's something else that we hear of when we, we read St. Paul's words. He says, working together with him, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. Again, what he's saying is, we're getting the grace of God. It's not that we're going to get it. It's not that we might get it. We already got it. You want to ask for something in prayer? Go ahead and find. Beautiful thing to do. But if you want to do it the way St. Paul is teaching us to pray, know that God was already working on it and already answered it. How can that be? How can God answer a prayer before we ask? St. Paul said so. We're working with him. He's working with us. And then he says, he's, he's encouraging us not to receive the grace of God in vain. Because that part wasn't in doubt. It was not in doubt whether we would receive the grace of God. What St. Paul encourages us here is, don't receive it in vain. Having received the grace of God, don't now turn back and say, well, I've received it, but I got it in vain. Or don't do anything that would act as if we got it in vain, meaning for nothing. And this is so important as we look at how we pray. We pray not to a God who doesn't understand, who doesn't know, who doesn't know much better than us what we need and how and why and when. We pray to a God who already answered the prayer long before we uttered it. And now the only question is not whether he's going to answer it, whether we are going to receive it in vain, because we're going to get it either way. The last thing I want to mention here is the line he goes on to talk about right after the line I read to you. He says, at the acceptable time, I have listened to you and helped you on the day of salvation. Listened and helped are both past tense. We already got it. So again, hitting that same point that we already got it. Not only do we get it, we're going to get it and get it in a way that is helpful. And this is where so many of us struggle in our prayer. We struggle because we hope God will understand what we know. That what we want, how we want it, when we want it, is the right thing. And how many times do we pray and we don't get the answer we want? We say, well, God, what do we say? Didn't answer my prayer. Can you imagine the things we say about God? God, God, forgive us and help us. Imagine how we would pray and pray differently if we could convert our minds and our hearts to see prayer this way. Prayer is not us bringing our request to God and wondering if he's going to answer us. It's almost the opposite. Prayer is entering into an understanding where God already knew what we needed. In fact, I want to show it to you in three different ways. Not only have our requests already been answered when he says, I have listened to you and helped you. Not only when he says to us that we are working with him, as St. Paul told us, his response is always what? A result of his grace. And this is, again, where we struggle with our prayer. Is prayer going to continue to be us, never saying this out loud, of course, never even thinking it, but talking to God and giving him his marching orders? Or is it going to be the opposite, where we, knowing what we want, knowing it's okay to ask for it, have the courage and the faith to show up and say, God, you know what I need, and I'm going to list them for you for my own benefit. And now I want to enter into and receive your grace, not in vain. I want to receive it, not in nothingness, but in fullness. You see, when we pray, we pray from a very particular point of view. And that point of view is that what we see and what we want is more important than what God wants. Today's epistle, excuse me, today's gospel is such an important example of that. Today's gospel, one of the most beautiful gospels, if there can be a comparison more and less beautiful, this is a more beautiful one, if that's possible. It's probably not. Jesus is coming into a city, and as he's coming in, a funeral procession is coming out. And in the casket is not an old man, a young man. 
And St. Luke tells us with more detail, not only is he a young man, he's the only son, the only son of his mother, and she's a widow. And so when Jesus raises this man, we all go, what a wonderful God we have, and we should say that. But think about all the other Gospels we hear all year long. Yes, we hear about the raising of Lazarus. Yes, we hear the raising of the child of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. And if my memory serves me, there are no other resurrections until Christ's. You and I would say, what's more important than saving a loved one from death? When we've encountered it, it's been horrible. And the younger the person, let's be honest, the harder it is to take. The worst thing in the world, I wish this on none of us, but many of you have endured it, to have a parent bury a child. Awful. And that's that awfulness that Jesus enters into today. So we might walk away and listen to this gospel and go, isn't it good that Jesus did this wonderful thing? Because death is horrible, especially the death of a young person. And he made it right. And if you walk away thinking that that's what God does, he fixes things in the way that we know he should, we get the answer wrong. Because next week and the week after, and for many, many weeks, we're not going to hear about Jesus raising people from the dead. In fact, the people he does raise from the dead, they're going to die again. He only raised Lazarus from the dead one time until Lazarus will be raised with all of us. You see, that's the key. That's the key to real prayer. Are we going to see the world, especially our own lives, as God does, or at least work for it? Or are we going to stand with our own values, our own desires, stand before God and tell him what he needs to do? Let's be honest, we've done that far too long and far too often. And by the way, if that was such an inspiring thing to do, to go to God and say, God, I want this, 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 all good things, why don't we do it more often? If that was such a good thing to do, we found so much comfort in just asking God for what we want, we would do it all the time. Why do we struggle with our prayers day in and day out? Because prayer is so much more than that. So I want to get into two practical applications of if we're going to ask God how we're going to do it and from what, one, from what perspective. When we pray the church's prayers, the church guides us. We open our prayer books and we read words that we didn't write. But those words aren't just words we say to God, they're teaching us. And if we look at how the church teaches us to pray, we don't only pray for ourselves. How often have we gone before God and said, God, I need this, 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 all great things. Never mentioned a neighbor. Never mentioned somebody who wasn't somebody that we were just concerned about, but the people that have needs for God that we're not concerned about. And so the church teaches us to pray not just for our needs, but to pray for the needs of the whole world. If you open your little black or little red prayer book that all of us were offered to have a copy of this year, you're going to see what's called a general, general intercession. By the time you're done with that, you've prayed for everyone and everything that is needful. So that's point number one in our intercession. We can't just limit it to ourselves. Point number two under that is we have to work and work really hard to adopt God's value system, not our own. And that was seen very clearly in today's gospel, both in the fact that he raised the young man from the dead and that he didn't raise everyone else yet. The purpose of Jesus' coming was not to stop us from entering into death. He could have done that. The gospels could be from A to Z. He raised this person, this person, this person, this person. It went on and on and on and on. It's not what he came to do. He came to not just raise each one back to this world. He came to raise us to a better life. Not just a better life, a perfect life. And the salvation that God has set out for us is one where is sickness important to us? Yeah, affects us in very deep ways. 
difficulties, loneliness, poverty, all kinds of things are difficult in this life. But nothing is more important for us to pray for than our salvation. Because you see, it's all going to pass away. All the difficulties, all the politics, all the viruses, even death itself will one day be trampled under once and for all. But until that day, what is it for us? It's our rest. When somebody passes away, we, grant, we ask that God grant them rest. Because someday those bodies will be raised again. And if they prayed for and worked for the one thing needful in life, salvation, then it didn't matter what they went through in life. In fact, from this perspective, often the most helpful things for us are the most difficult. You want to face up and try to deal with faith in Christ in the resurrection? Pray when a loved one dies. And that's when we're going to see most clearly how important it is to have faith in the God who is the one who conquered death. One more thing uh, we hear St. Paul say in the epistle about this is when he says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. In other words, we should prepare for judgment day. But he says, now is the day of salvation. Does that mean today is judgment day? Maybe. But every day is the day of salvation. Why? Because every day we can do what we need to do, how we need to do it, to bring us closer to it. Or not. If you uh, read your bulletins from yesterday, you learned that all the Middle Eastern dinner tickets were sold out. If you were like me and waited too long, and I waited too long, but I didn't wait too, too long. I got them two days before they sold out. I waited too long, but not too, too long. I got a ticket. Some of you said, well, I'll buy it next Sunday at church. And guess what? Sunday's here and the tickets are gone. What a wonderful example for us that Judgment Day is not going to come on the day we expect it. And the important day, what happens on that day, is not that day. It's all the days before. This is not the day to buy your ticket because they're gone. But every other time we got up and said, buy your tickets, buy your tickets, buy your tickets, that was the day. And the same thing with the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time that we can do something about our salvation. And that's where we need to put our focus. And that leads me to the final point I want to talk about in terms of what we do when we pray. If we don't focus on the fact that now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation, then every day we don't do that is the day perhaps we are not going to repent of that day's sins. I keep getting asked all the time, Father, how often do I have to come to confession? Once a year enough? And my first answer is always, will you tell me? How much time do you need, how often do you have to come that you can confess all of your sins from the last time you went to confession until the next time? Now, we're not going to remember all of them. But we certainly get a lot, more, a, lot more, a lot more close when we're four weeks out, six weeks out, maybe a few months out from the last one. Try to confess your sins after a year, two years, five years. And I can't tell you what God's going to do with our sins on Judgment Day that weren't confessed. I cannot tell you that. Not within my power, not within my knowledge. That's up to God. What I can tell you with absolute assurance, every single sin that we confess in confession and repent of are gone. You're not going to hear about it on Judgment Day because they're gone. Those strikes against us were written in the book of life. And then they were erased against us because we confessed and repented. That I can tell you. But you can't come to confession every day. I wish that was possible. Not practically possible. What we can do is every single day take stock of ourselves. Take stock about the past day. Think about where we've gone the wrong way. Not to feel bad about ourselves. Again, think about God's not values, not ours. The ways that God can heal us and forgive us and put us on the right path and take us off the path that we too often have on our own. 
So two things to put into those seven minutes, or at least the seven minutes we're going to start with, and that is to seek God's help in intercession, not just for ourselves, not just from our perspective, but from his perspective and for the whole world. And secondly, to have time to repent. I'm going to end today's homily where the gospel ended. After those people saw what they saw, they were at a funeral and they saw a man they didn't know probably touch the casket, open it up, and help a dead man wake up and walk around and give him back to his mother. After seeing that, listen to what they say. The gospel tells us fear seized them all. Fear seized them all. Didn't stop there. And they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. My brothers and sisters, God has been visiting us from the beginning of time until now, but most especially in the life of Jesus Christ. And when we stop to pray, he is no less present in that moment than he was when he stopped that funeral procession and gave a young man back to his mother. God has visited his people God is visiting with us all the time. And I hope we're going to take a few more minutes every day to recognize that, to welcome him and visit with him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.